Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. The debate about what books to teach in our universities is as old as universities themselves. Is there a classic body of work, a canon that every student should learn? What authors and what books should be included? It's important. Control the minds of the young and control the future. Joining us to look at the matter are Stanley Fish, professor of English at Duke University and author of Professional Correctness. Andrew Del Banco, professor of humanities at Columbia University and author of Required Reading, Why Our American Classics Matter Now. And Harvey Flaumenhoft, dean of St. John's College, which places a special emphasis on the Western canon and author of the Effective Republic, Administration and Constitution in the Thought of Alexander Hamilton. The topic before the House, the cannons roar, this week on Think Tank. Over the last decades, some students have chanted, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. Critics argue that too many professors have taken their advice. They argue that there is a body of knowledge which any educated person ought to know and that today's universities are not providing that. They point to certain statistics. Consider, for example, the results of a survey of college seniors by the Gallup Organization. 25% could not locate Columbus's voyage within the correct half century. 25% could not distinguish Winston Churchill's words from Joseph Stalin's. I speak to you in a solemn hour for the life of our country, of our empire, of our allies, and above all, of the cause of freedom or Karl Marx's ideas from the U.S. Constitution. 40% did not know when the Civil War occurred. Most could not identify the authors of works by Plato, Dante, Shakespeare, and Milton. Others see it differently. They argue that the texts of old are no longer relevant to students today, that the so-called dweems, dead white European males, are antiquated and need to be replaced with fresher perspectives. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Um, this is a uh, topic that has been uh, much in the news, much misunderstood, May I ask you for a short answer to a simple question, which is, starting with you, Harvey, what is this argument about? Well, I guess there are two questions. One has to do with inclusiveness, and one has to do with relevance. Um, many people think that what has been traditionally read leaves out all kinds of things that should be read. Other people think um, most of what there is to be read that's been around for a while doesn't have much to say to our current questions and difficulties. Okay, Andy Del Banco. <clears throat> I think this argument is about whether the past is dead or should be. Whether books that have survived the trial by fire in some cases, some of them have actually been burned <coughs> over the years, or trial by time, still have something to say to uh, each new generation. That's what it's about, I think. Okay. Stanley Fish? I more or less agree with Andy. I always think of Ben Jonson's line about Shakespeare, not for an age, but for all time. Uh, and there are some people for whom the status of being for all time is the one that should determine what books are on our reading lists and taught, and others who, in fact, want to focus on the age, that is, the present age, and what is considered relevant to the concerns, uh, especially of young people today. 
<clears throat> this argument does come out of a very big social change in this country. The, um, the population uh, that has access to higher education in this country has changed a lot, uh, and I think that's been a very good change in the last quarter century or so. So in an institution like mine, Columbia College, for instance, the students whom I teach come from a much wider variety of backgrounds than they once did. Right. So it was very natural for these students to ask the question, what have I got to do with these old books? They come from parts of the world that I have no blood connection to, perhaps. What have I got to do with them? It was a natural question. <coughs> let, let, let us get a little specific here for some of our viewers who are not, not as specific. erudite as we four here. Uh, <coughs> What were they, whoever the they is, the, the people who were the multiculturalists who wanted to change this, this curriculum, what, for example, did they want to put in and what did they want to take out? Maybe we can try to get a handle on this. It's a pretty complicated thing for yeah. us I, normal people. I, I want to um, point out in response to your question that everything we're saying here seems to be based on the premise that the canon, and you punned on the the word canon earlier, is this big, ponderous, heavy thing that needs about 15 people to drag it along, and it doesn't change, and it weighs a lot. Right. Now, that's simply not so. Right. And the fact is that the argument we're talking about here, as Stanley said, is a very old one. The canon has always been changing. If we, uh, our predecessors of 100 years ago listened to this conversation, they'd think we were all uh, apostates, with the possible exception of, of Harvey, because we've, we've put into the canon literature in the English language, That's which right. would have been denigrated as a vernacular literature. We've strayed away from the classics, which was once it was the canon. was a event when Hawthorne was first exactly. taught in any American I mean, my college. field is American literature, which didn't really enter the university in a serious way until at the most about 75 years ago, really oh. about 50 years ago. No, really about 30 years ago. Right. I was so, taught as a Renaissance scholar right. never even to associate with people who so, did American so literature. The canon is changing. It's My conception of the canon is it's a very large and fluid uh, thing which contains lots of good books. Mm -hmm. And the job of professors is to bring some of those good books to the attention of their students. I, I, I don't mean to be rude, but could somebody answer my question, which was, what are they saying about what you should put in and what you should take what out? What they're saying is what they've always been saying. Uh, I no, remember no, give 30, me some examples, 35 Stanley. years ago, 40 uh, yeah. years ago, was said, uh, we can't start now uh, teaching seriously Faulkner and Hemingway, because if we do that, we won't any longer teach Shakespeare and Milton. Earlier it was, we can't teach Shakespeare and Milton, uh, we will neglect Thucydides and Virgil. Now, we can't teach Zora Neale Hurston or um, uh, Alice Walker because we would neglect Hemingway and Faulkner. The arguments always follow the same trajectory. The beachhead that was won by a previous generation is now defended with the same obdurateness that met that generation 30 years ago. Ben, you want a direct answer to your question? Yeah, it would I'm, be nice. Okay. I mean, it, we, we I, were approaching it. I've there got 12 a... weeks to teach an American literature class. There's a, there's a sense on the part of a lot of people that I shouldn't waste a large part of that time teaching those old Puritans and writers like Hawthorne, and I should get right to the writers of the present day or maybe of the last 50 years who speak directly to the experience of my students. More women writers, more writers of color, writers who speak of the immigrant experience. And uh, I'm very sympathetic, more, actually, More to homosexual that. writers. That is and, big, and, one of and the And more gay writers. Right. So of course, we have some gay writers squarely in the center of the American canon, like Walt Whitman. I understand. And going um, back to the Greeks as well. Right. right, right. And okay. more right. being discovered every day. <laughs> right. Well, right. 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 Uh, I'm very sympathetic to that impulse. And, I, and in fact, in this book you were kind enough to mention, which has the word classics in it, I've got a chapter on Zora Neale Hurston and a chapter on Richard Wright, writers who would never have been there a generation ago. Uh, because I think they're terrifically good writers. But the fact is, well, we've got 12... Richard Wright was in our canon when I went to school in the 1950s. Okay, it wasn't an yeah. F.O. Matheson's uh, canon-creating book, no, however. But anyway, right, right, right. But right. Part, of, part of the problem is that um, many people who want to just jettison a lot of this <clears throat> start with certain assumptions about um, what the agenda is. Uh, certain questions are settled, and there's really no need to revisit uh, people far away and long ago. What have they got to teach us? Uh, <clears throat> we have figured certain things out, and the problem is to run with it. And one of the advantages of um, um, the pro-canonical view is that, uh, and one of the disadvantages from the point of view of these people, is you explore alternatives that um, uh, may be strange or may be offensive, 
but are certainly uh, different. I, I, I want to drop the puck on, on, on another aspect of this, and it, the word that I will use is deconstruction. Mm. What, uh, again, let's take the short call. Let's make believe we're starting this show over. And we're saying, now what are we talking about? That one always gets up there in terms, well, you tell me, what's that argument about? Because it is a related argument, isn't it? It is, but the relations are hard to see. In general, what deconstructive analysis shows is that certain kinds of coherences or, or, or neat and tidy narratives about history or the canon uh, or about the way in which a work uh, should be interpreted are not so neat and tidy. Deconstruction really uh, is the technique of demonstrating how it is that something we now think of as coherent or whole or obvious was constructed. Deconstruction has nothing to do, as it sometimes is thought in the, in the popular mind, with destruction. It's rather uh, the, the discovery but through it historical has something research. To do, it has something to do uh, uh, with the idea that literature is politics. Well, not necessarily. What, what it has to do, what deconstruction debunks is that the I or tries to debunk is that the idea that the canon we now have, or the list of major authors that we would all uh, mostly teach, is natural. That is, is somehow has floated to the top uh, of the heap uh, because of a merit that has nothing to do with history. Instead, deconstruction, deconstructive analysis, starts by assuming uh, the historical dimension. Uh, of achievements, which doesn't mean that those achievements are therefore denied, but that they're given a historical explanation rather than a theological explanation. It, it also debunks uh, an idea which I still believe in, that a, a, a text, and, uh, and they tend to prefer the word text to words like book or work, um, is not the product of a, of a single individual consciousness that has taken the language that he or she received and turned it into something with his or her personal stamp on it. It takes a different view, it takes the view that language sort of seeps into our consciousness and in a way writes the books through us. Uh, and so it tends to uh, want to uh, limit our, our uh, admiration or even perhaps adoration for the great creative consciousness that lies behind a lot of literary study of the past. And we might have gone a little too far in that uh, department, I suppose. We might have uh, elevated authors to, pe to a pedestal and overlooked the way in which they were writing for a marketplace, the way in which uh, they were limited in their ability to perceive the world by the culture in which they lived. But I still firmly believe, and that's why I do what I do and why I write what I write, that there are some people who have a genius for language. And it's those people whose books we should read. I went through, in a non-professional way, these kind of courses. A and what we learned is to say, uh, blank was a product of his time. That is what you wrote. That was the first sentence on your theme. <laughs> Erasmus, he was a product of his time. So this is, as you say, not new. Right. But it, I mean, the whole uh, 60s, the whole radicalization of the university allegedly Hasn't this put it to a, a new plateau? I mean, unless I'm inventing something, but there is, uh, one senses, the intensification of the bitterness of, of this argument. <clears throat> Let me address something specifically uh, to you, Stanley. The, there is this group, the National Association of Scholars, which advocates sort of the traditional curricula and opposes the politicization of research in the text. Now, at one point, I am told, you wrote to the provost of Duke University, and I quote, that NAS members, quotes, should not be appointed to positions on key universities' committees, distinguished professor, or any other committee dealing with academic priorities and evaluations. Now, uh, were that directed the other way, I suspect there'd be cries of censorship, uh, fascism, whatever. Uh, so. Where, where does that, that intensity of your feeling come from, oh, that for, for example? For example, yes, very, please. when I came across literature of that organization, which specifically said that works pr uh, done by scholars from a perspective of gay and lesbian studies or African American studies, or what was then called literary theory, uh, should not uh, be welcomed uh, and encouraged in the academy. At the same time, that document spoke of 
flexibility and openness of mind, and I therefore said that these people were disqualifying themselves by their own standards, and I would say it again, as I just have. But you would say that anybody who's a member of that organization should not sit on any decision-making body? Uh, that was offered to the provost as a challenge, which he quite appropriately turned back to me and said, no, I'm not going to respond to what you said, as I would have done were I provost. But I wasn't provost. What I was doing was pointing out an inconsistency in an argument, hoisting them with their own petard, as they used to say. Ben, there's plenty of intolerance on both sides of this debate. And um, that's if... Are you calling him intolerant? No. I want to get a little uh, fight going here. No, you're, you're not going to get me to fight with okay, Stanley no, this, this yeah, afternoon. Okay, right. uh, no, I think that the, uh, the right, uh, the panic on the, on, the, on the part of the right within the academy, that the old books are disappearing and that civilized discourse has come to an end and the barbarians are at the gates, is just as much a, a caricature of the reality. And a well-financed one. Because the answer, one answer to your question, where's the intensity? The intensity comes from the fact, and this has been documented over and over again, that a connected uh, network of right-wing or neoconservative foundations did something that is entirely and appropriately American, put on a political campaign designed to put certain kinds of people on a pedestal and others on a defensive. For example? It was, well, to say that those people who were teaching great books courses were holding up Western civilization and those b people who were moving in other directions were unraveling the fabric of civilization. You, this you, was an enormously successful <coughs> political effort. You know the rebuttal to, to that, which is they would maintain that the university structure itself has been taken over by the 60s generation radical left and they are the, the, uh, you're damn right they're financing a, a rebuttal because the whole damn establishment has been taken I over. Think that I, there mean, is, the I record, think there's some right. truth right. to the account of the demography of the academy. My objection is that this hugely political effort was uh, mounted on behalf of the removal of politics from curriculum matters. That seems not to me to work as an argument. If they organize politically and effectively against people like me, even though they mistake my teaching practices, my response should be to organize even more politically and effectively against them. I think the most disturbing change in the academy that, that I sense is that the old ideal, which a great predecessor of mine at Columbia, Lionel Trilling, called disinterestedness, that is the effort to walk into a room and try to open one's mind as much as possible to a variety of perspectives on fundamental human issues and to have as honest a debate as possible about them. He had no illusion that that was easy or even possible, but he thought it was a useful ideal to hold up as the point toward which discussion should go. I think that ideal is in trouble in the humanities in the university. There I and, agree. Uh, and I would, uh, I think if we don't get it back, we're going to be in very, very serious It's in trouble because it was a false idea. That is, disinterestedness is not only impossible in the sense that you couldn't possibly reach it, it's impossible in the sense that any form of it will be filled with an interest that is not announcing itself. Disinterest, in the law we call it facial neutrality. Any form of neutrality or disinterestedness is either entirely empty or is an agenda in disguise. There are no, no other possibilities. No, but you but can it, certainly it, it, take as your primary job uh, to help young people um, uh, understand uh, major alternatives as the authors present them, um, what the premises are, what the implications are, how the arguments put together. You may have um, preferences or views or some long-term agenda, but if you're teaching students uh, both uh, Federalist Papers, Adam Smith, and uh, Marx, uh, and Lenin, uh, uh, surely you can hold in check um, your long-term agenda uh, long enough to try to help clarify no. what the issues are for the The reason that you can't do that is because the basic facts that you would present, the organizational matters, this is what is said, these are the divisions, and so forth, those are themselves never innocent statements. From the word go, from your very first descriptive act, you are saying some things and not some other things, you and you are moving from, you are moving within a system of philosophical, moral, and sometimes, in my case, theological preferences that rule even 
the facts that you then dispassionately offer to your but students. You think there's absolutely no difference at all between neutrality and impartiality? I don't think there is. Uh, I don't think that either of them exist again, except as agendas that will not declare their names. But Stanley, the very the very fact that you uh, have a highly developed degree of self consciousness about this problem, mm -hmm. and that you're open and straightforward about it, is to me a great advantage as a teacher and a great advantage for your students. What I'm talking about is the degree of concealment, or the degree of contempt or disrespect that is uh, projected in the classroom for points of view that may be anathema to one's own. Of course we all, we can't extract ourselves from the circumstances in which we live and from our deepest convictions, but we can try to be aware of them, we can try to be honest about them, put our cards as it were on the table. Well, I think that awareness and honesty uh, are themselves uh, uh, good strategies rather than realizable objectives. But I do Stanley, agree with... are you being honest with us now? I am, <laughs> insofar as I know, but that's an important qualification. But I do believe, I, 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 I really do believe with you, that frankly polemical teaching in the classroom, that is in the, in the literary classroom, which says, I'm not here to teach you in whatever fashion about these literary texts. I'm here to convince you to vote for X or against Y in the next election. That's wrong. That's misplaced. Why? That's not doing your job. Why? That's not doing your job. What is your job? Your job is, in fact, I at least my job, you're a political scientist, uh, I'm a literary uh, person mostly, uh, my job is to present the materials that make up the content of my discipline and to introduce students to those materials in as forceful a way as possible. What they then do with that material and my teaching when they go into the ballot box or go into the marketplace is, of course, something I cannot predict and over which I shouldn't want to have well, any control. Wait, let, 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 I'm going to close this conversation on an up note. Is that in here? Now, tell us, and I think you sort of all have some agreement on this, why is this stuff really wonderful for a young person to learn? Because good books make people think. They make, they shake you out of your complacent assumption that what you know or what you believe or what you think is the only thing to know or believe or think. Right. When my students read the great chapter in Moby Dick where Ahab steps out onto the deck and tells the crew, you're not here to chase whales, you're here to chase my whale. And the crew becomes enthralled by the passion of his, uh, of, of his uh, uh, campaign, his crusade. My students, if they're alert, if they're doing something more than running their eye over the little black marks on the white page, if they're really reading, they start asking themselves questions about power, leadership, right. following, self-criticism, uh, and so on. That's what literature should do. I would add to that, at least in the way that I teach it, an engagement with language uh, that is usually uh, not uh, uh, affordable to us in the everyday life because it, it involves slowing down. For example, at the beginning of the second book of Paradise Lost, Satan is on a throne. Milton says of him, by merit raised to that bad eminence. I ask my students to consider the word raised, which is a homonym. It's either R-A-I-S-E-D or R-A-Z-E-D. Once you see that, the statement of Satan raised to that bad, e raised, by merit raised to that bad eminence begins to tremble. Merit turns out to be its reverse. The bad eminence turns out to be the lowest thing possible because raised either means elevate or destroyed and Milton has structured a sentence in which it means both and you have to stop on that sentence. How, you is, have it, to how think. is it spelled? It's, uh, well, the nice thing about uh, spelling in the 17th century was that it was entirely indeterminate. Mm -hmm. uh, orthog orth orthographic regularity is an 18th century invention. Uh, one of the, the things that's important, I think, is that you're trying to help students not to be mere products of their times. You don't help them to do that by telling them everybody before them was a product of his time. You do that by helping them to see that um, other people have uh, been very thoughtful and more thoughtful than you might expect and they uh, give you some experience of what that means. Thank you. Thank you all, uh, and thank you.
Uh, for Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you see Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.